ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. It might seem like they can get away with anything, but is the law finally catching up with the tech billionaires? Elon Musk's ex has been banned in Brazil and the boss of the encrypted messaging service Telegram has been arrested in France. So, as the world becomes more concerned about the dangers of social media, have we finally reached a turning point on big tech? Or is this merely a crackdown on free speech? Today, Mark Andrevich, a media professor at Monash Uni. I'm Sam Hawley on Gadigal Land in Sydney. This is ABC News Daily. Mark, we're going to chat about these big tech billionaires, their power and their influence, and the fact that, well, there's a couple of nations sort of going after them at the moment. So let's start in Brazil. Brazilians, they like Twitter, which of course is now known as X. There's something like 20 million users of the platform there. It's a huge market for Elon Musk, isn't it? One of these billionaires. Yes. As elsewhere, I think it's a very popular social media platform, especially for political discussion. And my understanding is it's the fourth largest international market for X. But over the weekend, Brazilians hoping to refresh their Twitter feeds were met with a blank screen. Tell me what happened. Well, there had been some ongoing disputes between Elon Musk, who runs X, and a judge in Brazil who had requested that certain accounts be taken down because they were spreading false information. And Musk refused to do that. And he also refused to appoint a local representative for the company who could be uh, held liable in Brazil. And the Brazilian government shut off access to, to Twitter. He is still making it available, as I understand, through his satellite network. Uh And it's still being accessed also via VPN, which allows people to make it look like they're somewhere else than in Brazil when they access the Internet. Right, yeah, to get around the rules. What was the misinformation that the Brazilians had picked up on? What was that to do with, do we know? My understanding was that it was false information being spread by supporters of Bolsonaro, the former president that were spreading false information about uh, rigged elections, you know, considered to be potentially harmful to democracy, to undermine credibility Mm. by spreading lies about how the electoral system was working. So what's Elon Musk had to say about all of this? He's been uh, on X, of course, making his views clear. Elon Musk portrays himself as a free speech purist and absolutist. Mm -hmm. And his claim is he doesn't want to shut down or deplatform anyone because he wants the platform to be open and available to all for free speech. This is a somewhat hypocritical stance on his part because Mm. he has in other jurisdictions complied with restrictions to take down particular users. Mm. And he apparently does this usually because he feels some affinity for the uh, government or because it's a big market that he wants to continue to have access to. And it's it's kind of an interesting question, the extent to which he will continue to deprive himself of a quite large market in Brazil because, as we know, the value of Twitter has gone down precipitously since he purchased it. And there is a question the extent to which he can continue to tolerate the shrinkage of the economic value of that company. So he argues, of course, the move in Brazil is a move made by an oppressive regime and it will hurt free speech. And we better unpack that a bit more in a minute. But first, the timing was really interesting, wasn't it? Because it came just after a decision by the French to also go after another one of these big tech billionaires. In that case, the founder and CEO of Telegram, Pavel Durov. 
The messaging app Telegram says its founder and chief executive has nothing to hide after he was arrested in France. Pavel Durov was detained when his private jet landed in Paris. French media say he's accused of failing to take action against criminals using Telegram. Durov, as you say, is the, is the founder of Telegram, an app that he created actually when he was concerned about what he felt were intrusions on free speech in Russia. And he uh, is originally from Russia, although he now has multiple citizenships globally. And he created an app that he wanted people to be able to use to be free from forms of government uh, intrusion and censorship. There's been some interesting description about the level of encryption that it provides. Encryption allows messages to be shared between people in ways that cannot be read by others besides the sender and the recipient. Mm -hmm. That would be the case of end-to-end -end encryption. And Telegram does permit end-to-end -end encryption if you specifically select it for a one-to-one -one chat. But Telegram also provides one-to-many chats and group chats. Those are not end-to-end -end encrypted, but what it does still allow is encryption as messages travel through the internet, which means they can't be read by other folks who manage to capture them as they go through the internet. But those messages are stored, as I understand it, on servers that Durov has access to. And that may be one of the things that the French police are interested in. What was he actually arrested for then? There was some sort of criminal activity that police came across. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not clear to me that they've specified the specific criminal activity, but there are certainly concerns that about the possibility that Telegram can be used for circulating child sexual abuse material, participating in illegal transactions, you know, drug transactions or other form of criminal activity. And it seems that the French police are interested in seeing what information they're able to get from the Telegram platform that may help them in their criminal investigations. But Durov has been very recalcitrant, not even responding to requests. And it seems they felt they needed to make their point a little bit clearer. So, you know, when it, when it comes to the overall principle, encryption does have a very important role to play in the face of oppressive regimes or in the face of investigative reporting and even just in terms of private matters that people do not want to disclose publicly for potentially legitimate reasons. The, the fact that there are legitimate uses of encryption, that I don't think would absolve somebody like Durov from uh, having to at least respond to legal requests in a democratic regime like France around legitimate criminal concerns. All right, well, let's look then, Mark, at the wider implications of this, of this decision in Brazil and, of course, the arrest of the founder of Telegram. Do we damage free speech if apps like this are banned in other nations? The notion that X itself is a free speech platform, I think, is a little bit misguided. And this is why, A, we know that Musk does deplatform folks at the requests of some governments when that request is issued. But the other thing which I think is even more important to understand, and it rarely comes up in these discussions that take for granted the notion that this is a free speech platform, is that in important ways, X exerts editorial control. That means it has algorithms to decide what content to elevate and what content to suppress. And those algorithms pick and choose. You know, it decides to do that based on what it thinks is going to get more engagement. So that algorithmic curation, it's commercially beneficial, but it can be socially pathological because it's making money off of deliberately elevating the content that's the most sensational, the most attention getting, and often the most polarizing and very often not the truest. So this is not free speech in the sense in which the term is generally understood, which is that everybody gets equal access to voice their views. That's not the case. One of the things that's going on here is 
we are getting a sense of the character of what we might call unhinged billionaires who imagine they are above all of the law and all of the nations. <laughs> they just radiate the sense that somehow they're above it all. And there are different ways to perform, I guess, your role as a, as a tech billionaire. But both Durov and Musk perform that role as really kind of high-profile, hyper-libertarian, free speech absolutists who imagine themselves above accountability. Mm. And, and I think, you know, th these moments of accountability attract attention because, you know, on the one part, there are very real issues at stake. But at the same time, there's also just a concern about the, the behavior of these types of characters. Mm. And so I, I think both of those things are going on in the, in the public and political reaction. Mm. All right. Well, Mark, both of these stories, do they spell a shift in appetite for holding these tech billionaires to account? You know, countries are starting to take them on. Is it the beginning, do you think, of something larger? Yeah, and, and I'm not even sure it's the beginning. It's, uh, you know, as somebody who's been following the tech industry for a while, it's been really interesting to watch how it went from being a kind of darling of, you know, both journalistic and academic world and also political world to being viewed as something quite different. The tide has shifted. You know, we, we had a, an understanding of the way in which these social media platforms are engineered to get us to spend as much time as possible. And they're kind of hacking our reward centers. And we started to be concerned about uh, the level of use of various apps by young people. And that can come at the expense of democracy and the well-being of the populace. And unless they're regulated, they will do what other large-scale companies do, which is push the limits to make as much money as possible. I think the tide turned a while ago. And these folks who've amassed so much power and are behaving in ways that look unaccountable to large portions of the populace and also to political players who are concerned about the role that these folks can play in the political sphere. It's perhaps not surprising that we're starting to see this type of action. Mark Andrevic is a professor in the School of Media, Film and Journalism at Monash Uni and a chief investigator with the ARC Centre for Automated Decision Making and Society. This episode was produced by Cara Jensen McKinnon. Audio production by Sam Dunn. Our supervising producer is David Cody. I'm Sam Hawley. Thanks for listening. Listening.